Dear colleagues, in partnership with the Deutsche Gesellschaft for Nephrologie, the Österreichische Gesellschaft for Nephrologie, and the Société Francophone de Nephrologie, Dialyse, Transplantation, Marcus at Home welcomes Dr. Delphine Douillet in Angers, in the heart of France, and Professor Dr. Grégoire Legal in Ottawa, Ontario, in the heart of Canada, with whom we would like to discuss indications for thromboprophylaxis in hospitalized patients in internal medicine, and in orthopedic patients after leg trauma, focusing upon their symptoms and casting studies, respectively, which have been two late breakers at this year's ISTH meeting in Montreal, Quebec. Dear Delphine, dear Grégoire, it's a real pleasure to welcome you for our experts discussion on October 13th, which is World Thrombosis Day. We're happy to host you. Hello, everyone from me too. Welcome to Marcus at Home. If you're new here, this is an academic YouTube channel with videos on topics such as nephrology, angiology, and COVID-19. As you've heard already, today's topic focuses on the prevention of venous thromboembolisms, and we're very happy to welcome you both. I'll do a quick introduction. So the Professor Legal is currently working in the Division of Hematology of the Department of Medicine in the University of Ottawa. He's also a senior scientist in the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. He just published on the prevention of venous thromboembolisms in hospitalized older, medically ill patients, which we'll be talking about in just a little bit. Dr. Douillet is an emergency physician in the Centre Hospitalier Universitaire d'Angers, so in France. She is working on a new risk stratification score in patients with lower leg trauma who need immobilization, not requiring surgery, to help us decide when or when not to prescribe anticoagulation therapy. So thanks to the two of you for being here. Thanks to as well to my two co-hosts, who are the Professor Custodes, who is the head of the Department of Internal Medicine and Cardiology at Klinikum Saarbrücken. He also specializes in ICU medicine. And Professor Heine, who is the head of the Department of Nephrology at Agapesion Markus Krankenhaus in Frankfurt. I'm Sarah Morell. I'm a junior doctor currently working in the ICU department. And I'm really looking forward to this discussion. I'll let you begin, Professor Legal. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So this is a this is a, a randomized trial on thromboprophylaxis in older medical patients. And we'll come back to why did we do that more than 20 years after the Medinox study uh, studied the, the role of enoxaparin for prevention in, in admitted medical patients. But before I, I start, I want to pay respect to my a mentor and the primary author of the publication, Professor Dominique Mottier, and he was a head of internal medicine in, in, in France and was a father of the thrombosis research group in, in Brest, Brittany, France. And he was a, certainly the uh, inspiration and the main actor of this, of this clinical trial. Uh, these are my disclosures, uh, including uh, some work for Sanofi, who is a maker of the uh, enoxaparin drug that was used in this study. So we'll skip that one. Uh, just to go back, to go straight to the, to the background of that study, which is uh, to this day, admissions to hospital represent one of, the, one of the main causes of VTE and actually certainly the most preventable cause of VTE worldwide. It is estimated that more than one third of all the DVTs and PEs that we see are provoked by hospital stay. And it's frustrating because we do have the tools. We did have these studies back in the days. Uh, yet there were some recently uh, challenges uh, to these recommendation too for wide use of thromboprophylaxis, mainly uh, after the ACCP decided to focus on symptomatic outcomes, while the, the initial studies about thromboprophylaxis also included as part of their outcome asymptomatic DVTs that would be detected by screening ultrasound at the end of the study period. And so when you do that, you find many, many DVTs many of them being prevented by the low molecular weight heparin, uh, but the panel writing these guidelines uh, felt that uh, it was a bit unfair to put uh, the same weight on a asymptomatic events whose prognosis is, is largely unknown with uh, major bleeding, which is a main side effect of, of, of low molecular weight heparin. And we, were, uh, we don't have uh, data uh, using um, low molecular weight heparin and using as an outcome uh, symptomatic events. And that's a challenge because people did some extrapolation from these initial trials 
in, whom, in which patients who were diagnosed with an asymptomatic distal DVTs were treated with anticoagulants, hence preventing later occurrence of a symptomatic BTE. So it, it's impossible to say from these older studies whether uh, if these asymptomatic DVTs were left untreated, whether you would have then a much higher rate of symptomatic BTE, hence a great benefit of, of thromboprophylaxis for most patients. So that's why uh, we decided to redo a clinical trial uh, where we would uh, use uh, symptomatic outcomes uh, as our primary outcome. One of the other challenges in, in prevention in medical patients, uh, and that was highlighted for the recent trials as well, is that it's often hard to identify high-risk patients. And recent trials use a very complex combination of patient risk factors, demographic, uh, you need to be more than 75 years and have CHF and be immobilized for that number of days and the dimer must be higher than whatever. And it ends being so complex that it's, it's hard for the, for the practicing physician to uh, really find the patients that, that might benefit. And so that's why we uh, chose to A, focus on older medical adults feeling well from epidemiological studies that are clearly the population that has the highest risk and, and also uh, not to restrict on other risk factors, like not to restrict on the admission diagnosis or the mobility level. It's, it's, it's very, very difficult really, to assess what, the, what will be the expected mobility level on the, of a patient when they are admitted to medicine, right? Would they stay in bed for three days, four days, two days, and the same. So we're like, you know, predicting the future is always a, a, a tough thing to do. So let's not uh, make assumptions there and just, and just involve them all. Uh, so hence, hence the design of the study. Uh, so double-blind study uh, centers, mostly in France, uh, two in Switzerland. Um, I will skip that quickly. I, I'll let you go through it quickly, but uh, one in one randomization to ANOX 40 daily or identical looking placebo syringes for a duration of six to 14 days. And that's, that's relevant, we'll see that later. So as, as we said, very broad inclusion criteria, age greater than 70 admitted for hospital, uh, well, likely they will stay. So we didn't want patients that would be coming just for a one or two days a planned or scheduled intervention, for example, right? And what we, the exclusion criteria was mostly focused on, on, on contraindication to low molecular weight health. Right? So as I said before, primary outcomes, symptomatic outcomes, and we also collected, and we did, we did the primary outcome measure at 30 days. And that was what was done in most previous clinical trials. And maybe we were wrong about that. We can come to the, back to that in the discussion. And we used as a secondary outcome, uh, outcomes up to 90 days as well. And safety outcomes were major bleeding and, and clinically relevant non-major bleedings. Uh, so initially, uh, the plan, so it, it was an intention to treat population, uh, time to event, competing risk analysis. And uh, the initial assumption was that the placebo group would have a 2% risk of symptomatic outcomes, and that the low molecular weight happen would reduce that risk by 50%. And so it was an event driven superiority trial, and it was estimated that we needed 70 observed events to be able to demonstrate a 50% reduction with a 5% five ty five type 1 error. And that meant that the, the, uh, using this estimate of 2% versus 1%, that the total number of patients to be enrolled would be up to 4,630 patients. And one of the key issues was that uh, we uh, uh, actually did not get, well, initially it was a choice. We, we weren't supported by Sanofi, the maker of the enoxaprine. So it was really the, the peer reviewed grant funding of the study that we used to, uh, to secure funding. And we actually uh, worked with a manufacturer of uh, some uh, of, uh, enoxaprine syringes and they were the ones who gave us the, the, the study drug and the, and the placebo supply. But what, and obviously, you know, pandemics and other issues. Initially, it was also, we applied for some European funding. And so it was supposed to be an H 2020 project. Eventually, it wasn't accepted, uh, meaning that we had to focus on, on, on France only and, and Switzerland and, and using a Programme Hospitalier de Recherche Clinique, which is one of the main uh, granting uh, system for uh, clinical research in France. 
Uh, but certainly it, it made that we had access to a lower pool of patients, recruitment was slower than expected. And what ended happening is that our um, study drug supply syringes expired in October, 2020. And despite multiple attempts to secure more, more supply, regulations had changes, the pandemic had kicked in and they certainly the low molecular weight heparin makers were busy uh, producing low molecular weight heparin for uh, the, the huge demands that the COVID produ uh, created. And there was no appetite to stop any production chain to start doing placebo instead of actual product, even for a short amount of time. So we unfortunately, so we had some discussion as to, or oh, should we keep going as an open label trial or uh, discussions like that, but we ended uh, having to stop the study after 2,500 patients were uh, enrolled. Uh, so these are the, this is a, the, the flow chart of the, of the study. So 2,500, 1,200 uh, something patients in, in the IT, ITT population. And some uh, patients uh, lost in the per protocol population. I was discussing the duration of treatment. As you can see, in each arm, uh, approximately 200 uh, patients were treated for less than six days, which was a minimal intended duration of treatment. Um, and that uh, certainly led to some attrition and, and something we can comment later as well. Baseline characteristics of the population. Uh, as you can see, we targeted and we obtained an older population, 82 years of age. Um, I will let you go through the rest of it. So severe uh, renal failure was a contraindication. Uh, this is a distribution here. Uh, this was a, a randomization strata below 50 versus more than 50. Uh, very interestingly, almost half of our study population, remember it's an older group, were taking uh, aspirin as well. Uh, concomitantly, and that wasn't a contraindication. We excluded patients who were on dual antiplatelets, but patients who were uh, only on, on, on uh, single antiplatelets were allowed into the study. And um, you can see here the reasons for admission. So main diagnosis being infectious disease, respiratory failure, but also a lot of patients coming because they had a malaise or fell at home or or failure to cope or, or typical uh, admission diagnosis in, in a general internal medicine ward. Uh, mobility level here and the hospitalization here. So length of stay eight days, which is certainly much shorter than what we had back in the days in the initial studies about the long wait happened. So this is a main slide, I guess, uh, about the main result of the study and uh, showing a non-statistically significant difference between the two group. The rate of symptomatic VT or VT-related deaths at the month, at one month was 1.8% in the enoxaprine arm versus 2.2% in the placebo arm. So 0.4 reduction, but as you can see, a, a confidence interval that's uh, overlapping one. Uh, no difference in death. Uh, these are the stratified analyses, uh, interestingly uh, showing, for example, here, uh, as you can see, that you know patients on concomitant antiplatelet therapy actually did pretty well on, on the noxaprine. We didn't. That wasn't a again a, a primary test. There was no difference when they were not taking um, uh, aspirin. And that's what I was alluding to in the introduction is that when you look at the rate of symptomatic outcome at 90 days, uh, you start seeing some differences here with a 1% absolute risk reduction, which was uh, at the limit of, of statistical significance. But interestingly, when you look at what these events are, uh, these were mostly pulmonary embolisms, the difference between the two groups. And you had 14 uh, uh, cases of pulmonary embolism in the NOx arm, uh, include some five of them were fatal versus 25, 11 of them were fatal in the placebo arm. And that was also a 1% absolute risk reduction, sorry, in the risk of, of symptomatic P. All of these required a readmission to hospital. And again, borderline uh, statistical significance here. This is a, a kepler mayer curve up to, uh, up to 30 days. And this is a curve at 90 days. And I think it's quite interesting because you see uh, some kind of maybe legacy effect, right? Where on, when in patient in the enoxaprine arm, sorry, uh, initially had some events, but then it looks like it plateaus 
while in the placebo arm, it looks like events continue to occur regularly over time during the course of the 90 days. So, you know, we will come back to that in the discussion, maybe even one might hypothesize that maybe here, when you're in placebo, you start growing these asymptomatic uh, events that are preventing in the inox apparent arm. And because they, you didn't prevent them in the placebo arm, they become clinically overt. They grow into becoming a, a plain DVT or PE over the, over the following months. Uh, so something to keep in mind and something that was important to discuss in the study as well. These are the safety outcomes. And actually that was a very reassuring uh, result. Uh, showing that you know no difference in the risk of major bleeding whatsoever between inox and placebo, and that even stands true in patients on concomitant antiplatelet therapy, as you can see here. Rate of major bleeding was higher than the one not being on antiplatelet therapy, but not different between inox users and placebo users. Um, so that's pretty much it. So in terms of discussion, I, I went through some items already, but so no superiority of enoxaprine versus placebo on the primary efficacy outcome of symptomatic VT among older adult patients admitted to hospital and acute medical illness. Uh, due to that uh, premature discontinuation of the study after we couldn't secure the drug supply, there was some, uh, the study was clearly underpowered to, to detect such a difference. Uh, no difference, but whatsoever in the risk of bleeding. So in terms of strengths and limitation, uh, well, I think it was important to, to attempt a study focusing on symptomatic outcomes. I think the fact that we weren't using complex risk stratification models, that was seen as a limitation by others. But I think from a practicing physician perspective, it, 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 was, it was a strength and certainly the focus on older patients as well. Limitation, we discussed recruitment already. Uh, it was more challenging than expected to recruit these patients. Uh, you know, a lot of older patients, when well, many more have cognitive impairments, uh, but patients' relatives were often not keen on patients being randomized into a clinical trial. A bit of you know overprotection of their of their of their parents maybe. So we had many cases where uh, the patient himself was able to consent and said yes, but then on the next day, you know. Uh, the so children came and said, no, 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 he doesn't want to do it. And, you know, anyways, that, that was a, a the daily life of the study kind of thing. And, and interestingly enough, um, uh, due to shorter duration of stay, and even if we had planned that uh, if a patient was to be discharged before day six, they could go home with a supply of low molecular weight happen to finish at least a week of low molecular weight happen, this in many cases didn't happen, either because a patient, the family, or the, even the physician were like, oh yeah, well, you know, it's day five or it's day four, it's okay, he can go home and nothing. And, and so up to one sixth of our patient did not complete the intended minimal duration of seven days. And when you look at the subgroup analysis, with, again, with the eyes of face, maybe uh, you, uh, you, you might think that it did make a difference. Uh, certainly, again, primary result is negative, but uh, I, I alluded to that three months risk and, and how there was that reduction in the risk of VT at three months, maybe uh, particularly the risk of PE. And I think that's something important to keep in mind when we decide whether we want to uh, change practice. Uh, I thought the results about antiplatelet therapy were also quite uh, interesting. And again, that that discussion as to whether we need a minimal duration of treatment to achieve uh, desired effects. And that was a conclusion slide of the trial. And I think I'm, uh, and then, oh yeah, my fancy, my fancy end of, uh, end of presentation with all the contributors, as you can see, it took really, really many people and many centers across the country to be able to uh, recruit the total number of patients uh, uh, quite huge thank you if some are in the in the audience or in the virtual audience uh, because it was really uh, quite a challenge to get this study going through and that was it thank you greg Rolf, for this presentation and congratulations to this really important trial it's a really important and pragmatic trial I think because it's born from from everyday life from it's a it's a really tough question we face every day. And um, thank you also for shedding some light on difficulties recruiting people and recruiting patients. I didn't expect that to be so hard because it's 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 pre 
pragmatic and 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 I, I, one 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 could argue that there there must be a lot of patients to recruit for the study so congratulations to your hard work um i think i'm not the only person in the room on uh, who didn't expect that result um so it leaves me a little little perplex and um uh, leaves me alone with the question so what's the truth it's is it of course you showed uh, the opposite is it regression to the truth so we just don't need it you showed us the curves and the, the curves are truly diverging because of some some difficulties some some factors the the result was different it was really tricky to interpret right we're like okay is it and also you know we we all were uh, raised under the evidence based medicine where you know okay your study is negative your study is negative there's nothing else to say about it right and and so initially that was that was our stance when we were writing it as well but then we're well i think i think there is enough in there to tell people that likely they shouldn't like stop prescribing just because that study is negative right and likely the main reason for that is the fact that we lack statistical power and you've seen that curve uh, at the beginning where like the, 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 we had quite a few events almost immediately after randomization and for whatever reason, particularly in the enoxaparin arm. And maybe that was, well, it has to be just bad luck. And, and to the point that, you know, maybe some patients were even uh, had already PE, even if obviously we excluded patients who would have any symptoms, but it, it was so bizarre to see that many cases in day one, day two, and maybe that was bad luck and that would have balanced over time, it's hard to say, right? But certainly again, that, that kind of legacy effect and that 1% absolute risk difference in, in, in symptomatic PEs at three months makes us so likely, likely you know, there is, there is a, something that we weren't able to detect and maybe maybe the three months uh, out, the three months time frame is a better time to consider when we discuss these matters or or, you know, hard to say for sure, right? Mm. But but certainly, I think a message of caution and saying, you know, it brings some new data, it brings some new evidence. I don't think it's telling us stop prescribing thromboprophylaxis in elderly patients. You showed us a really broad panel of patients, like an all comers design, I guess. And what, what I noticed, there are uh, not so many patients with acute heart failure or heart failure. Um, and and uh, in the most hospitals, heart failure population is really big. Do you think, or can you speculate, if you enrich the population for 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 more, maybe more aggravated disease that that could have affected results? Yeah, we didn't look in details in uh, in you know again subgroups yet. But certainly, and as you said, broad population, and that was one of the criticism, right? Why didn't you use a Padua score? Or why didn't you use the improved score? Uh, as I said, we we clearly did not want to do that because sometimes we felt that it was a bit, it's a bit complicated. It's not really well validated yet either any of these uh, decisions uh, system. But certainly, that one of the of the ancillary analyses that we started working on now. Is to look at that, right? How do how do these scores perform? And uh, actually, even even without doing that, we got some some absolute risk reverse quite significant, right? In the two percent range. So you know, it looks like uh, as expected, all the patients are at high risk anyway, right? Or at significant risk anyway. And then, as you say, we certainly will look into. I think we did some subgroup based on based on. Uh, admission diagnosis also they get uh, really small you know interesting if you look at the at the heart failure uh, there was like you know no events uh, on and on the 79 person receiving an oxaprine versus four events on the uh, among the 80 patients receiving placebo so you're right maybe maybe more to dig there may i ask you why did you decide and you partly already gave the answer in your publications but why did you decide to go for heparin rather than for DOAX? Yes. Well, I think it was because, um, well, as you know, right, the DOAX studies have been a bit disappointing so far. So there was a, there was an apixaban study that failed to reach a non-inferiority um, uh, margin, right, a non-inferiority hypothesis. And the rivaroxaban study was more, uh, 
did meet their non-inferiority hypothesis, but then had a significant increase in the risk of major bleeding. So they were never approved in that indication, except in the US and in, in a few countries, but they, they were never approved for prevention in medical patients. So we were, mm, let's let's try. I think, I think the idea was let's go back to the drawing board, like proof of concept, uh, like the, what we know very well, long term weight heparin versus placebo. Because I think if we would have done a DOAC study, uh, you know, picking picking a pixel and then it was negative, and people would have said, oh, that's because of two, the pixel maybe, right? Because it, uh, because of the previous studies. So that's why I think we wanted to to, to uh, and the same for 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 rib. So I guess that's why we wanted to go just back to the to the to the fundamentals and to the basic and and test again long term weight heparin. But in these earlier studies with this increased bleeding rate, this was kind of confounding by the longer treatment ranges in patients who received drugs. So they not only compared heparin to drugs, but also short treatment to longer treatment. So, but um, maybe another question in your manuscript, you said that we should have additional studies in this field. Now, with all the difficulties you met, I am positive that few people are eager to restart this. But do you yeah. expect that we may uh, may get some studies in this field with a new, say, anti-factor 11 or 12 inhibitors, that there may be new interest with these new substances? Or are you aware, are there already any studies ongoing in this field? I'm not aware of any. I agree with you that that would be particularly because you can see the challenge, right? That we see all these events occurring after patients went back home. And then as you alluded to, we have a, a few studies looking at extended thromboprophylaxis in medical patients. And so far, all of them failed to identify a group of patients that would clearly benefit. It's really frustrating because we know that uh, more, most of these events will occur after hospital discharge. We don't have a good stratification tool to identify when a patient goes home, who should go home on, if, if any, should go home on extended thromboprophylaxis, right? So the, the for example, the concept of that uh, monthly or injection of anti-11 drug, for example, or, or a drug that would have a long lasting effect that could be given during the hospital stay, but then you don't have to worry about what happens next. The patient can go home and he will still be protected after he goes. I, I can certainly see uh, some future for, for, for such a study there. Maybe one, um, not last question, but for our, for our viewers, you are the expert now. Did, did the results uh, affect your, your approach in the next couple of months, did you what what conclusions uh, did you draw in your clinic at your site? How do you pragmatically uh, 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 select patients now? Yeah, it's interesting, right? Because some people see the glass half full, some see it half empty, right? So some people come to me and say, "Well, okay, so clearly you're showing that you know it's not the end of the day if someone is not getting it." Or so I think some people are more. Um, again, considering that uh, what, what the guidelines suggest actually, but that risk benefit balance, right? And saying, well, that patient's high risk of bleeding, for example, with the non clear benefit that we've shown, I don't want to give him much because I, I might cause harm, right? Uh, but some, some people would rather see again that, that maybe longer term effect or the fact that if you don't do anything at all, Maybe at one month you don't see something, but maybe later on you might you might have more more events. Or my own my own person, I I don't think I did change my personal my own personal approach to it. Again, I see it as a you know interesting data, but certainly caution in terms of certainly I wouldn't stop prescribing based on based on our on our study. And are you using these scores in clinical practice? Because I'm not aware of anybody in Germany who's really using the Padova score or anything like that in clinical practice. Yeah, no. Here in Ottawa, we, we have like an, an electronic alert. So, you know, people are, are reminded of, okay, did you consider, uh, did you do that risk stratification and did you decide to prescribe or not to prescribe? Uh, but we don't, we don't mandate a specific uh, Derivative, uh, like clinical decision rule or anything. So the thing is, they they've all been derived 
in studies where uh, low interval weight trapping was already common practice, right? And and actually, when you look at their area under the curve or the prediction ability, it isn't so great. And and likely because it's complex, right? To predict who who which patient will will be at higher risk, and because you you know again we you do that on the days they come, but who knows how will be their mobility level in three days, seven days? Who knows whether they will still have fever or whether you know they will be already healing or, or so it's, it's I think it's a hard thing to 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 do actually. And again, it's all general rewards. You did not include patients on ICU where I guess you would be even more open to go for prophylaxis, <laughs> don't you know? Yes. So I also yes. have two final questions before giving the microphone back to Sarah. So uh, surely as a nephrologist, I have to ask you once again, and we briefly discussed this in Montreal some months ago. So why did you go for full dose with enoxaparine in patients with a creatinine clearance or GFR down to 15? So did you consider to reduce enoxaparine? We usually go for 20 milligrams in these patients. And there was a slight increase. The general data do not show an increase in bleeding, unlike in the earlier studies, but in these people with impaired kidney function, there's a slight increase in bleeding. Yes. Yeah, so, well, so if you look at the people with a, so if you look at the uh, major bleeding at 30 days, on with patients with a clearance greater than 50, there was a minus 0.27% risk of bleeding on the NOx versus uh, placebo. And on the other side, below 50, it was plus 0.2 with wide confidence intervals. But, but well, I think it's because we, we remain traumatized by the Medinox study showing that 20 milligram was just as placebo, right? It was not more effective than placebo at all in any subgroups, even in all the patients who were likely some, some renal uh, failures there as well. So that's why... I think it's uh, yeah we we I personally never never give the twenty uh, in these patients if the clearance is too low then I I, I would rather switch to unfractionated heparin but really really in the medical study twenty was all along whether it was on clotting or bleeding was really similar to to placebo in terms of of, of effect. My last question here. So some months ago, I think also from Canada came the metric study, which is not general medicine, it's traumatology, but which compared aspirin to low molecular weight heparin and which found that aspirin is actually quite similar to low molecular heparin when it comes to thromboprophylaxis. Now, looking at your results, it looks as if patients do not really differ whether or not they are on aspirin. So for your clinical practice, do these data on aspirin change your approach? Would you be more reluctant in the future to give thromboprophylaxis on the quite high number of patients who already receive aspirin? Well, I think, so the interesting thing about the aspirin subgroup was that the as well as you say, actually the patients who were on aspirin overall had a lower risk of BT in our study, right? And but uh, interestingly enough, the risk appeared to be even lower when they were on enoxaparin as well. And and what was really surprising even was that there was no sign whatsoever on bleeding, even in patients taking both the aspirin and the low dose lumicum weight heparin. So that's that's very reassuring because that's a common question, right? Or should I stop the aspirin if I start someone on thromboprophylaxis? And it looks like you don't need to do that. And if anything, you might, you know, well, that's subgroup of subgroups, so I shouldn't say that. But you know, we might even improve efficacy without without uh, impacting safety that much. Uh, as you say, right? These studies were done mostly in patients undergoing hip replay, well, hip or knee surgeries, right? Is these uh, aspirin thromboprophylaxis trials? Uh, I think it's a bit of maybe the same story as in medicine with, you know, much shorter duration of stay, fast track surgeries where patients go home on the same day, are instructed to mobilize very early on. So certainly the risk went down over the years, right? Um, certainly, I, I, and, and we see that in practice, right? That if someone is, is, has a true high risk of VTE, like say they had a, a P in the past or uh, we still we still give some anticoagulant prevention rather than aspirin prevention, uh, but but it looks like yeah these studies are reassuring for for the you know all comer patients undergoing this type of surgery provided that they really are able to benefit from that fast track path. 
I think if if if, if anything happens, then like this, that should be reassessed. Yes, yes, so thanks so much for sharing. Um, I'll let the Dr. Douillet continue with her new risk stratification score, the TRIPCAST score. I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. Okay, so I would like to thank you for giving me uh, the opportunity to present our work. So um, I'm really happy to present the casting randomized trial about targeted thromboprophylaxis in patients with lower limb trauma requiring immobilization. So a patient with lower limb trauma requiring immobilization is really a frequent condition. So it is around 12,000 patients every day in France in the emergency department. So these patients have a higher risk uh, to develop VTE. And we can say that the prevalence of symptomatic VTE is uh, uh, around 2% at three months in this population, but there is a highly variable prevalences between study um, according to the variety of population and endpoints. So to prevent uh, VTE, uh, prophylaxis anticoagulation with low molecular weight heparin has been proved to, um, to be effective as shown in this Cochrane um, meta-analysis. So um, the first study uh, was made by QJAT and AL, and then several studies assessed the efficacy of uh, low molecular weight heparin in this population. So you can see here the odd ratio at 0.4 uh, in favor of, uh, of treatment. However, um, the prevalence of symptomatic VT uh, between these studies varies really, and the most recent study named podcast by Fun Adrishem um, failed to demonstrate an efficacy of low molecular weight heparin in population of low prevalence. The most important of this meta-analysis is the conclusion is that further research might give more directive and specific advice for different patients or patient groups based on patient and trauma characteristics. So there is really a need of risk assessment model uh, to allow us to individualize treatment. So uh, thanks to a collaboration with the, the Leiden team, we've combined our two previous scores, the TIP score, a French one, and the Leiden TRIPCAS score. Uh, so we developed the TRIPCAS score, and it was, it was derived and validated in the MEGA study. Uh, and then we validate it on the podcast study. So in this slide, uh, you can see the TRIPCAS score um, obtained uh, with three main parts. The first one is for trauma with three cat categories according to the severity of trauma, four type of immobilization and 12 uh, variable for patient characteristics. So the cutoff um, to, to define the low risk subgroup is seven. So if you, you have a high soccer players um, who have a, a, a tibial fracture treated with lower leg cast, so we have two, three points and two points, and it being a male one point, so he had a six, he has just six points, so he is uh, considered at low risk of VT. So we uh, retrospectively on the podcast study, a patient with trip gas score under seven had a VTU risk at 0.8% at three months, representing almost half of the population. So in the casting study, our hypothesis is that a large subgroup of patients has a low risk of VTU with a trip gas score uh, under uh, seven, and in this population, prophylactic treatment can be withheld. And we can say that there is a small subgroup of patients at high risk benefit of the treatment. So this can um, lead to avoid daily injection and uh, decrease the risk of bleeding. So we do this, the casting study. It was a step well from the trials conducted in 15 centers in France and Belgium. So after an initial controlled phase of three weeks, uh, each center was randomized for switching from the control phase uh, to the intervention phase. 
In the control phase, uh, prophylactic anticoagulation was prescribed according to the physician usual practice. And in the international um, period, prophylactic uh, treatment was prescribed according to the TRIPCA score. So no treatment if the TRIPCA score is less than seven. Uh, every patient um, were contacted by phone at uh, 30 days and 90 days. Um, to assess whether, whether they had um, undergone any assessment of a suspected VTE or bleeding. And um, an adjudication committee review all possible outcomes. The primary endpoint was the safety of the strategy assessed by the symptomatic VTE rate at three months in patients at low risk in the interventional group in the as randomized and per protocol population. And uh, we assess the rate of prophylactic anticoagulation between the two groups, symptomatic VTE rate at three months between the two groups, and major and non-major bleeding between the two groups. So um, we included all patients with isolated lower limb trauma requiring an immobilization for at least seven days. And we exclude patients with current anticoagulant treatment at the time of the trauma trauma requiring surgery um, or hospitalization for more, for more than two days. So for the sample size, um, we expected a rate of symptomatic VT at three months uh, in patients at low risk um, less than 1%, with the upper limit of the confidence interval less than, one, less than 2%. So we plan to include 1,500 patients. And we expected um, uh, fifteen percent reduction in prescription rate between groups. So uh, we plan to include two thousand one hundred patients. We publish the protocol. So in the casting study, we included two thousand one hundred twenty patients, uh, and we included uh, fifteen centers in each group. So we analyze. Uh, 603 patients in the control phase and 1,505 1, patients in the intervention phase. In the inter interventional uh, group, 1,159 uh, 1, uh, patients were included uh, with a score less than uh, 7. You can see here uh, the baseline uh, of the population. Uh, the, mm, the median age is 30, uh, 35 years old. And patients were included mainly due to intermediate or low risk trauma, treated with a lower leg cast or semi rigid cast. The mean duration of anticoagulation was 27 days. So the main slide is here, it's uh, the results. So the three months VTE rate in the population as randomized in the low risk um, subgroup of patients during the interventional period was 0.7% with an um, uh, upper limit of the confidence interval at 1.4%, so less than the safety threshold. Concerning the rate of prophylactic anticoagulation, in the control group, uh, the rate of pre prescription was 50.4%, uh, and um, in the interventional group, 24.5%, so an absolute difference of 26% in prescription rate. There was no difference uh, differences in, between the control and the intervention uh, group um, according to the three months symptomatic VTA in the uh, world population. Uh, concerning bleedings, uh, in the control period, there were no bleedings, and in the inter interventional period, there were uh, two non major clinically relevant bleeding in non anticoagulated patients. The score compliance rate was um, 96.8%. So to discuss um, the results, um, the, this study uh, can um, show the, the safety of withholding prophylactic treatment for low-risk patients based on the TRIPCA score. 
so uh, we can target it prophylactic anticoagulation strategy and it was associated with 26 absolute decrease prescriptions so we can individualize uh, treatment and provide a better quality of life avoiding daily injection for patients and there is a really interesting uh, thing for high risk patients. Despite an anticoagulation with low molecular weight heparin or fondaparin, uh, the VTE rate was high at 2.7%. So we can say that TRIPCA score uh, separates the population in two different risk categories. But we can ask the, the question um, if a low molecular weight heparin or, or for fondaparinux are sufficient to uh, prevent VTE, and if uh, if DOAX uh, could be a better option in this subgroup. And I think further research will uh, need to define the best strategy in this subgroup. So the strength of uh, this uh, trial it is uh, the first implementation trial of a risk assessment strategy in patients with lower limb trauma. But there is also um, several limitations. The prescription rate vary from country to country, and the effect of the intervention can be different in another setting, like in Canada or in the US. And uh, there is a low prevalence of BT, so, but it is the population of usual care in our emergency department. So to conclude, in the emergency department patient with lower limb trauma uh, requiring immobilization, targeting prophylaxis anticoagulation on the TRIPCA score allowed to safely whistle anticoagulation in a large subgroup of patients at low risk of VT. So I, I would like to thank all participating uh, patients and centers and the support of InnoVTE and uh, my research team for this study. Thanks so much for your slides. They're really interesting. I just have a little question why you decided to um, focus on this kind of group of patients. So you work in emergency care. Do you have a lot of contact with patients with lower leg trauma? Um, why do you have a special interest for them? Oh, yes. Good question. Um, trauma represents uh, around 36% of our population in the emergency department. And in this population, there is a, a large group of patients with low volume trauma. So it's really a frequent condition in our emergency department. And um, I'm working in a team in Angers uh, um, who um, uh, work uh, a lot on VTE. And I think there is a, really a link. and. Uh, it's really a daily question in our practice. And why did you include, for instance, patients who needed surgery or other patients who needed to be immobilized for other conditions? Okay, um, we it's really a different question um, for patient immobilized for uh, acute medical uh, disease. It's really different, I think. Uh, but for patient with surgery, um, it's interesting because in podcast, the first study made by the Leiden team, there is a, a subgroup of patients with surgery. And um, in our study, we decide to just focus on this uh, topic. But I think the trip casco could be interesting in this population with a non-major surgery for lower limb trauma. I think it's interesting uh, because in podcast uh, um, it was validated on this population and it was uh, good. Um, in the study, you said also that you have an app. I downloaded the app and tried it and I just wanted to congratulate you. It was really intuitive and easy to use so I can recommend it to our viewers. But that's it from me for now. I'll give it over to um, Professor Heiner. May I just ask you this TRIPCAST score, is it already validated for patients who undergo surgery or if we use this score, and Sarah just mentioned that we are able to use it quite easily, so uh, should we for the time being use it only in patients with trauma who do not undergo surgery? Okay, good question. So um, initially, uh, um, it's for non measures It's possible to include non major surgery, um, but it was mainly validated in patients with uh, lower limb trauma requiring just an immobilization. But I think it's interesting for this uh, group of patients. 
but it's um, it's just a part of the podcast study. So I don't have a study focused on this patient with uh, surgery. And we just discussed that in internal medicine, the prediction scores are not really used like the power score. Do you already now in your clinical practice apply the score? Surely it's your own score, so you're very motivated. But in your daily clinical practice, is this done in Angers and in other centers in France right now? <laughs> yes, in Angers, we apply that. There is uh, uh, some poster on the, the, the application it's uh, in all the phone. Uh, so we use it uh, in daily practice. Um, and in emergency um, medicine, we um, we usually uh, use a lot of score because we know um, it uh, allows us to uh, uh, stratify patients and uh, make a good um, uh, strategy of diagnosis. So we, we usually use uh, a lot of score. Um, so in Angers, I, I can say yes. In France, um, I think it is uh, used and we are working on the new uh, guidelines in France and the, the trip casco um, is mentioned. So I think uh, it will be most used. So my last question, do you expect, so again, similar to what we discussed just earlier with Gregor, do you expect the novel factor 11 and maybe also factor 12 antagonists to be game changers in traumatology or may our expectations be too high since we heard for a couple of years that this is the new wonder drug uh, allowing us to prevent any deep vein thrombosis without any additional bleeding. So uh, what are your expectations for factor 11 surely and uh, 12 inhibitors? Yes, I read a little on this. Uh, I I expect uh, the result of other study. I I think there is there's no study um, which will assess that in this subgroup of patients. But um, I'm really interested, uh, and uh, we will see, perhaps. So, thanks so much to the two of you. It's really fascinating to see this data. It's fascinating to see that we got so many very important clinical studies from France, from the Netherlands also, from Canada. So it's great to have all your activity and we're somewhat lagging behind here with our German studies. But anyway, it's, it's great to have you and thanks for doing the studies. Thanks for being our guest today. This was part one of our ISTH best of series and, and we shall continue in a few weeks when we plan to host Dr. McBain and Isabelle Marais again from France to discuss Eve and the APICAT trial on cancer associated thrombosis, a chapter which we discussed last year again with a colleague from France with Dr. Bertilotti from Saint Etienne. So thanks again. Bonne journée à Ottawa. Bonne soirée à Angers. Thank you. And happy World Thrombosis Day, everyone.